Welcome to Nerd Heaven. I'm Adam David Collings, the author of Jewel of the Stars, and I am a nerd. This is episode 72 of the podcast, and today we're back into it. We are beginning the second season, the final season, of Stargate Universe. And specifically, we're going to be talking about the first episode of season two, which is called Intervention. The description on Gateworld reads, As Destiny's crew continues to battle the Lucian Alliance soldiers over control of the ship, TJ finds herself and her baby transported to a safe place. This episode uh, was written by Joseph Melozzi and Paul Mully. It was directed by Andy Makita, and it first aired on the 29th, 28th of September 2010. I'm so organised, but we'll get there. <laughs> So, last season, we left off with Colonel Young surrendering his crew to the Lucian Alliance invaders, who had come through the gate from the Icarus-style planet in the Milky Way galaxy, and had taken over the ship. The only way to save the crew from dangerous radiation levels from a binary pulsar was to give control of the ship to Kiva, the evil leader of the invaders. Eli was rushing to open a hatch so that Scott and Greer could get inside from out on the hull of the ship. As is customary, we have a new prologue thing. It changes every half season, so we'll get another one around halfway through season two. This one highlights the conflict between Young and Rush, the problems with the blue aliens last season, the mysterious planet from the episode Faith, where TJ wanted to stay and raise her baby, and recent events with the Lucian Alliance. The episode begins with TJ waking up in the log cabin on that planet, the Faith planet, the one that had been artificially created. She feels her belly, and she's not pregnant anymore, but she hears the cry of a baby. Kane is there in the cabin. He was one of the crew who wanted to stay on the planet. He believed that the aliens who built the planet put it there specifically for the crew of Destiny, and that they had a plan. So we have confirmation that Kane and some of the others did indeed remain behind on the planet. But Destiny left that planet, left that entire galaxy. Kane says that for aliens that could make a planet, a little intergalactic transport is nothing. TJ asks, are you saying they brought me here? Well, you're here, aren't you? Kane replies. So there he goes again, making assumptions. As I pointed out back in the episode Faith last season, Kane's faith has no basis. Faith is believing in what you can't see. But you actually have to have something to believe in. Cain just believes in things that essentially come out of his own imagination. TJ can't imagine how or why she is there, but it seems that both she and the baby are safe. Back on Destiny, Eli gets to the door and manages to open it. But it's too late. Scott and Greer didn't make it. We live in that for a few seconds, but then we immediately hear Scott's voice. He had a feeling he wasn't going to make it to Eli's hatch in time, so they headed for the back of the ship, and the shields must have protected them. It seems the Lucian Alliance have a new leader, but Kiva is technically still alive. The bald guy seems more interested in taking control himself than helping her, but one of the others convinces him. They're going to use the stones to try and get a doctor on board to help her. Apparently, not everyone in the Lucian Alliance is military. They have civilians too. And that makes sense. They are essentially a society. Humans who have been freed from gold slavery and wanted to band together to make a new life. But they were pretty aggressive about the way they went about it. Many of them, presumably their military, wanted to fill the power void left behind by the demise of the system lords. Eli gets Scott and Greer back inside the ship, and they're all surprised to see Chloe walk in. She shouldn't be able to walk. Last time Eli saw her, she was barely conscious. Now her pain is gone and her strength has returned, as if by magic. That's an interesting mystery. The countdown has started. And that means the ship will soon be able to jump out of this dangerous region of space. But for some reason, Rush doesn't appear happy about it. What is he hiding? The doctors have arrived, four of them. 
They're working hard on all the wounded. Things are not looking good for Kiva. There's a bullet lodged in her liver. The Lucian Alliance guy says it would be in everyone's best interest if she survived. Which sounds suspiciously like a threat. But I think it's more than that. This guy is one of the more reasonable of the invaders. He knows that if Kiva dies, the bald guy is gonna go crazy and kill everyone. As for TJ, she's not dead. Not yet. But both her and the baby are in a bad condition. They both might die. So her body is still here on Destiny. Her mind has been transported to the planet. Or is she just hallucinating while unconscious? Whichever it is, she seems very happy here with her baby. TJ is surprised that Kane and his people have built such a comfortable place. They haven't had enough time to make all of this. And Kane agrees. They were still working on lean-tos with dirt floors when the winter was coming. Then one day they found these buildings abandoned. But that doesn't make sense. They scanned the planet and they didn't find any evidence of settlements. TJ questions the buildings appear from nowhere, and that's just good enough for Kane? He says without the buildings they wouldn't have survived, and that's good enough for him. And I get that. I'd be grateful for the shelter no matter where it came from. But it wouldn't stop me wondering how it got there. Curiosity would drive me to want to know more. TJ is thinking through all of this logically. Why was she brought here? Not just because she was wounded, there were many other wounded on the ship. Why would she be singled out? I'd forgotten this whole thing happened so early in the season. I knew it was coming, but I didn't remember that it was in the very first episode. Kane assumes that the aliens were scanning them all from the moment they set foot on the planet. They knew TJ was pregnant. He thinks that they saved her because she was bleeding out on the floor. She and her baby would have died if the aliens hadn't intervened. So, there's a problem. Kiva is officially dead. I'm not going to shed any tears, but everyone needs to be worried about what the Lucian Alliance are going to do next, especially that bald one. Scott and Greer have stashed Eli and Chloe somewhere safe and are sneaking around the ship. That safe place turns out to be the lab, so they're there with Rush and Brody. Telford managed to transfer some control to Rush. He is currently slowly transferring power away from the shields. The same shields that are keeping them alive. He says he's doing this to prevent the ship from jumping, which is pretty weird. Surely they want to jump away from here. What is Rush's perspective here? Rush thinks that the Pulsar levels the playing field. It's a danger to the Lucian Alliance as much as it is to the crew. Sooner or later, the bad guys are going to have to deal with it. Interesting. So an interesting thing about this binary pulsar. The writers needed some kind of spatial phenomenon that would present jeopardy to the crew. Pulsars are really as deadly as portrayed in this episode. Except they cycle very quickly, like every few milliseconds. If one was slowed down to pulse every 22 minutes, it would not have any devastating power behind it. You wouldn't even know it was doing anything to you. Stargate science consultant Mika McKinnon explained on a recent episode of Dial a Gate, which you should watch by the way, how they invented a way to make it work. They theorised about a pulsar that was almost ready to start pulsing, but it was in a binary system with another star that had a lot of mass that could feed the pulsar. Essentially, the other star would circle around and every 22 minutes it would get near enough to the pulsar to feed it and make it go crazy. I'm not explaining it as well as she does. This was a great idea, and it worked. It made scientific sense, and it met the narrative requirements of the story. The only problem was, it was completely theoretical. No such system had ever been detected in the universe. The cool thing, though, is that several years later, researchers found a system just like this in the real world. They called it the Black Widow Star. I just think this is such a cool story, and it shows how seriously the people making Stargate Universe took the science. They could have just invented any old nonsense, and most of us would never have even known, but they took the time to come up with something that they thought was plausible, and then the universe said, 
Yep, I have one of those. Here it is. Very cool. The Lucian Alliance are arguing about what to do next. Bald Guy wants to kill everyone. Reasonable Guy wants to stick to their original plan of leaving the crew on a habitable world. Bald Guy's reason for wanting to kill everyone is the fact that Kiva is dead. I'm not sure how that logically follows. People on both sides have died. This is war. Seems he's driven solely by emotion, and pretty unstable emotion at that. But another of their number has a different idea. A young woman who we'll come to know as Gim. She's been on board all this time, but I don't think we actually saw her on screen in the last two episodes. I might be wrong, but if we did, it would have been a background non-speaking role. It seems unlikely they'd have hired an actor just for that, to then give her a major role in this episode. Anyway, she's found one planet they can dial from their current location. It's locked out, probably because it's on the extreme limit of their range, but she can override that. If the planet turns out to be viable, they could send all of the Destiny crew, except the doctors who are still working, to the planet. Reasonable Guy wants to keep TJ. She could be useful, and moving her in her condition could kill her. It seems that Scott and Greer were listening in on this conversation. Now TJ wants to know how Kane can have knowledge of what is happening on board Destiny. Kane can't explain, but he believes the knowledge came from the aliens. Oh, and by the way, TJ's baby is a girl. Telford is alive. He's just woken up. The bad guy still thinks that he's one of them, although I think Reasonable Guy is sceptical. He's already determined that the planet is viable. Now, Young says that he can't possibly have had time to determine long-term viability, so this is a death sentence. But they don't have a choice. The crew are ushered through the Stargate. Young is the last to go, taking one last look at his ship, the ship that has been taken from him. The planet looks bleak, cold and dark, and there's a storm coming. But Scott, Greer, Rush, Brody, Eli and Chloe are still on board, so there's still hope. Except most of them have just been discovered. Gin can't figure out why the countdown has stopped. Bald Guy nearly kills Gin because he doesn't like the answers she gives, or rather can't give. This is how he treats his own people. Scott and Greer arrive just in time to rescue Rush and the others. Rush tells the invaders that he will keep diverting power from the shields until they lay down their weapons. He claims he and the others are willing to die to prevent the Lucian Alliance from getting their hands on the ship. A bluff if ever I heard one. Rush isn't going to die for any principles. Worst case scenario, he'll try to work with these people simply so that he can continue studying the secrets of destiny. I'm not saying he'd betray his friends, but he's no martyr. Bald Guy is officially taking command of the Lucian Alliance. Anybody have an objection? Nobody speaks up. Not even Reasonable Guy. Rush thinks the crew are better off on the planet because they're out of range of the Pulsar. But that only makes sense if the crew can survive and defeat the invaders so that they can bring them back on board. Bald Guy has sent Reasonable Guy and his followers to the planet along with Young and his people. So that's an interesting turn. Young has zero interest in seeing these people as allies, but Reasonable Guy says they're there because he stood up for Young. And that's absolutely true. Anyway, it seems like Lieutenant James has found shelter, so that's good. Scott and Greer have taken sickbay. The stone connections have been severed. Camille is herself again, and the others who served as hosts to the Doctors are somewhere else. Camille confirms TJ is going to make it, but the baby isn't. It may already be dead. And that sucks. But some great acting from Ming-Na as she breaks down and cries over this. Camille is a very strong character who doesn't readily expose any vulnerability. But this is the death of a baby. Nobody with a heart could fail to be broken by that. Kane has taken TJ outside to see some glowing lights in the sky. A little like an aurora, but bigger, brighter, and more impressive. And it kind of looks like a glowing nebula. It appeared last night, just before TJ did. Nobody knows what it is, 
or what it means. Kane expresses his gratitude to TJ. If she hadn't returned with Young, nobody would have been allowed to stay on the planet. They all owe her for that. He thinks that's why the aliens saved her daughter and brought her here. But then he says that only the baby can stay. TJ will not be allowed to remain because she made her choice. But Kane has just acknowledged that TJ never wanted to leave and her doing so helped all of them. TJ is devastated. She doesn't want to go back. She's finally got her chance to be here on the planet. Apparently the aliens have told Kane all of this. Rush is playing a hard and dangerous game, but he's probably right. It seems that Gin is Eli's opposite, on the other side. She's the brains behind Bald Guy's brawn. Telford's familiarity with Rush helps him to convince Bald Guy. Telford knows Rush is a coward and wouldn't sacrifice himself. He also knows that Rush would be willing to sacrifice his own people, just not himself. Eli makes a good point. Bald Guy is nuts and you can't reason with a person like that. Telford argues against Bald Guy. In the end, Gin is convinced. She shoots him. She calls Rush and surrenders. They'll comply with his demands. It looks like the good guys have retaken the ship. TJ doesn't want to leave. She wants to be on this planet. But most of all, she wants to be with her daughter, who she has named Carmen, wherever they are. Kane warns her that nobody on the ship will understand. They won't believe that she was ever here because what they've seen is different. Remember, her body is still lying on a bed in sickbay. And with that, she wakes up, back on the ship. How long was I off the ship, she asks. Camille tells her that she was here the whole time. And then she breaks the news that her baby died. What they have seen is different. The rest of the crew have been brought back on board the ship from the planet. There is still some Lucian Alliance on the ship, including those exiled with Reasonable Guy. For now, Young is going to put them all together, in lockup presumably. Scott tells Young that most of the credit for saving the ship goes to Rush, and he's right about that. We've set up an interesting new status quo for Season 2. We have a bunch of prisoners on board, people who we are going to have to learn to live with, but it will be very difficult to trust. Young goes to see TJ. Remember, this wasn't just TJ's child, it was Young's child as well. He's lost a daughter too. It's a painful moment. We still have the mystery of Chloe's miraculous healing from her bullet wound, not to mention the weird dissolving man from two episodes ago. Destiny has only made a short jump. They've dropped out where they were supposed to drop out all along. The ship is safe and back to normal. TJ doesn't look like a woman who's lost her daughter, and that's because she believes her daughter is alive and well on the planet. But what are we to make of all of this? Neither TJ nor Carmen were ever bodily on the planet. Their bodies were on board Destiny the whole time. So if they now have a dead baby's body, in what sense is the baby on the planet? Did the aliens manufacture a new body for her? Maybe transfer her mind and her soul into that body? Creating a new body would probably be within their established abilities. Mind transfer probably as well. As for the soul, well that all depends on what you believe. And many people believe that the body and the mind is all that there is. So was any of it real or was it all a dream that TJ was having? She has no evidence to support it, only her belief, her faith. That is, until she sees the nebula, the shining lights exactly like she saw on the planet, here where Destiny drops out of FTL. She couldn't possibly have known what that nebula would look like before this moment. That is some hard evidence that what she experienced was more than a dream, that it was in some way real. But it's not evidence that she can use to sway anyone else, because nobody else saw it. It's internal evidence, but it doesn't really help her prove anything. In an interesting way, TJ's faith is significantly more grounded than Kane's was back in Season 1. She has something tangible, a foundation for her faith to sit on. 
She believed what she believed because of what she saw and heard, and because of the evidence of the nebula. Kane had none of that. He was just making stuff up. Ironically, despite that, he may have been right in some of his beliefs. It does appear that the aliens are aware of the Destiny crew and have taken an interest in them. Back in the episode Faith, Kane had no basis for believing that. But now, TJ does. It's all very interesting. I am absolutely convinced that we would have continued to see more of Kane, Carmen and the Faith Planet in future seasons. This was clearly being set up as a long-term story element. I can't help but wonder how much the writers had figured out in their heads already. What does Brad Wright know about the mysterious aliens who made the planet? And might he reveal some of it in his new show if it ever gets made? I live in hope, and dare I say, faith. So that's what I have for you this time. Next time, we're looking at the episode Aftermath. I always like it when these big moments get subsequent episodes that deal with the aftermath. I've talked before about how hard the writers of Star Trek The Next Generation had to fight to get their Aftermath episode made following the best of both worlds. Aftermath will also introduce an exciting new element into the show, which I'm looking forward to talking about. I'll catch you then. In the meantime, you can find my original works of science fiction by going to adamdavidcollings.com slash books. I'd encourage you to check them out. Have a great two weeks. Live long and prosper. Make it so.